Many strange things have occurred in the United States, from mystifying murders to hair-raising hauntings and vexing vanishings. There is certainly no shortage of the bizarre and the unexplained. A lot of these stories have begun fading away from memory. It's understandable in some ways. They happened a long time ago, and they seem to be destined to go on without answers. However, today we're going to bring ten of them back into recollection. Number 10. The Impossible Murder of Isidore Fink Criminal investigations often say that there is no such thing as a perfect murder, but the death of Isidore Fink might come as close to that as possible. The man was a Polish immigrant who came to New York City in the early 20th century and opened a laundry inside a large ground floor apartment where he also lived. On the night of March 9, 1929, a neighbor heard screams coming from his living quarters and summoned a policeman. What the officer found still puzzles criminologists and animal sleuths to this day. There was the body of Isidore Fink, dead from three gunshot wounds, alone in an apartment which appeared to be completely boarded up from the inside. Because Fink lived in a dangerous neighborhood, he was always careful about security. Both the front and back doors were locked from the inside. The windows had been nailed shut, also from the inside, and even if they weren't, they were too narrow for a full-grown adult to squeeze through. In fact, to gain access, police had to break one of the windows and asked a local boy to climb through and unlock the door. Investigators obviously suspected suicide at first, but there was no gun to be found. There were no fingerprints other than Fink's, and nothing had been stolen. They even searched for hidden panels or passages but found nothing. They looked for a motive, but the landlord said that the laundry operator was a quiet tenant who never caused trouble or associated with dubious characters. The NYC Police Commissioner Edward Mulroney dubbed the case an insolvable mystery, and so far, he's been right. Number 9. The Rock Island Wreck On August 9, 1894, the train traveling on the Rock Island Railroad in Lincoln, Nebraska, was derailed off a 40-foot-tall trestle, killing 11 people. This turned out to be an act of sabotage, as spikes had been pulled from the structure while a crowbar had been used to pry the railroad ties apart. It remains, to this day, the deadliest act of mass murder in the state's history, tied with the 1958 killing spree of Charles Starkweather. But the question is, who caused it? The blame quickly fell on a black man named George Washington Davis. There was no hard evidence against him, but he was still convicted of secondary murder after two trials. He spent a decade in prison, time during which Davis had several groups lobbying for his innocence. Eventually, in 1905, then-Governor John McKee paroled Davis, citing grave doubts regarding his guilt. Nobody else was convicted of the crime, so the question remains, who caused the Rock Island wreck? Number 8. The End of Al Swearingen Fans of the Western TV show Deadwood will be familiar with Al Swearingen origin the foul-mouthed, cutthroat owner of the Gem Theatre Saloon and Brothel. What they are probably not aware of, though, is the mystery surrounding his death. The real Al Swearingen left Deadwood in 1899 after his beloved Gem burned down for the second time. Afterwards, details of his life become blurry, but allegedly he died a penniless vagrant in an accident while trying to hop onto a freight train. This was the story of Swearingen's demise for over a hundred years. It changed in 2007 when historian Jerry Bryant, who also served as an advisor for the Deadwood TV show, found Swearingen's obituary. It said that Swearingen died on November 15, 1904, near his home in Denver, Colorado. He had been hit in the head with a blunt object. This alone was not enough to declare that he had been murdered. It could have been an accident after all. However, something strange happened a month before his death. Al Swearingen's twin brother, Lumel, had been attacked as well. He was hit in the head and shot five times, but the killer didn't take the $200 that the mill was carrying. This was definitely murder, and modern historians have come to believe that he died in a case of mistaken identity. The killer wanted to kill Al Swearingen dead, but targeted the wrong twin. A month later, they corrected their mistake. As to their identity, that will likely remain a mystery, but it wouldn't be too hard to imagine that they could be someone looking for revenge. Number 7. The Haunting of St. James If you're passing through New Mexico and need somewhere to stay for the night, there are few places more historical in value than the St. James Hotel in Cimarron. That is, of course, if you don't mind staying in a place that is allegedly haunted. The hotel was first built in 1872 by Henry Lambert, a man who previously served as a personal chef to Abraham Lincoln. In need of a new career, Lambert headed out west looking for gold, but his prospecting wasn't very successful, so instead he opened a saloon and restaurant. His place proved popular with travelers along the Santa Fe Trail, so Lambert added guest rooms to his building. A veritable who's who of the Wild West stayed at his hotel, Wyatt and Morgan Earp, Buffalo 
Ruffalo, Bill Cody, Annie Oakley, Batmaster, and Dark Holiday, Pat Garrett, Billy the Kid, Jesse James, they all stayed there several times, always in room 14. His future killer, Robert Ford, also stopped by at St. James. Due to the hotel's popularity with cowboys, gunslingers, and outlaws, it wasn't exactly the safest place in the world. In fact, during those rough and tumble days of the Old West, as many as 26 men were killed in fights at the St. James. During a renovation in 1901, over 400 bullet holes were found in the bar's ceiling. Like with many other places of violence, people began reporting instances of unearthly activity. The epicenter seems to be room 18, which is kept locked at all times and never booked by customers. It is said to hold the angry spirit of Thomas James Wright, a man who was shot at a poker table and crawled to his room, where he bled to death. Number 6. The Origins of Dighton Rock There are many mysterious ancient objects in America that have yet to reveal all their secrets, and one of those is Dighton Rock. For over 300 years, the giant boulder covered in petroglyphs has puzzled researchers regarding its origins and the purpose behind its images. The earliest surviving description of the 40-ton rock comes courtesy of Reverend John Danforth in 1680. Ten years later, Puritan author Cotton Mather gave a more detailed account, opining that it depicted an earlier unknown group of people who sailed to America. Who exactly these mysterious travelers were has been debated for centuries. In 1767, founder of Brown University, Ezra Stiles, believed that the drawings were made by Phoenicians who visited North America over 2,000 years ago. Others said said it was the Armenians traveling through Siberia, or perhaps the Japanese or the Chinese. Danish historian Carl Christian Raffen claimed the Markins were Norse, indicating that a thousand years ago, Thorfinn, the Icelandic explorer, visited those parts. In 1912, Professor Edmund Della Barr claimed that not only he knew the origin of Diet and Rock, but also what the inscription meant. According to him, the markings were made some 500 years ago by Portuguese explorer Miguel Cotarial in a type of Latin shorthand, and they said, I, Miguel Cotarial, 1511. In this place, by the will of God, I became a chief of the Indians. His account remains as controversial as all the others, and the true meaning of Titan Rock is still a mystery. Number 5. The Identity of the Shotgun Man Throughout the 1910s, Chicago had its own bogeyman who terrorized the inhabitants of Little Sicily, also aptly called Little Hell. He was simply known as the Shotgun Man, and he was allegedly an assassin associated with extortionists known as the Black Hand. It is said that everyone in the neighborhood knew who the shotgun man was, yet he walked the streets with impunity because nobody would dare identify him. He particularly liked to prowl the intersection of Oak Street and Milton Avenue, an area fittingly designated as Death Corner. He would lie in wait at the bottom of a stairwell, and when his target came into view, he would fire a load of buckshot. Afterwards, he would walk away without a care in the world. It is hard to say exactly how many people fell victim to the shotgun man. He attained such mythical status that, for a while, most murders committed in the area were ascribed to this one individual. It is generally considered that he was responsible for around 15 killings, but that number grew to hundreds with the subsequent retellings of the shotgun man story. Nowadays, the legend has evolved in such a way that we aren't even sure anymore that he was a real person and he wasn't just some figure dreamt up by the Black Hand to scare the locals. Who he was, how many victims he had, and what happened to him are questions that we'll probably never get an answer. Number 4. The Spirits Inside Eastern State Penitentiary In 1829, the Eastern State Penitentiary opened in Philadelphia. It was the first prison in the country to employ the separate system of incarceration where individual confinement was the primary priority. Prisoners could serve their entire sentence without ever seeing another inmate. Besides the isolation, the penitentiary had a lot of extreme punishments reserved for problem prisoners. Outdoor ice baths in the middle of winter, iron gags, and something called the mad chair, where inmates were bound so tightly that circulation was cut off to their limbs. To put it mildly, the penitentiary has seen more than its fair share of misery during its 142-year existence. The Eastern State Penitentiary closed down in 1971. Since then, it has developed a reputation as one of the most haunted places in America. Not surprising, given that over a thousand people died inside those walls, many of them after experiencing huge amounts of despair and torment. Stories of such restless spirits have been around since the 1940s, corroborated by inmates, guards, visitors, and prison staff. You'll hear screams and footsteps follow you on long empty corridors. Shadowy figures are sometimes seen on the walls, while the ghosts of a particular guard have been spotted multiple times in the same tower. The penitentiary operates as a museum now, but it doesn't look like the furious phantoms plan on going away anytime soon. Number 3. The Vanishing 
of Dorothy Arnold. Dorothy Arnold was a young New York socialite who disappeared without a trace on December 12, 1910. She was last seen on Fifth Avenue, one of the busiest streets in the world, and was apparently headed for a stroll in Central Park. The 25-year-old was an aspiring writer who came from a very wealthy household. Her father, Francis Arnold, was your stereotypical patriarch of an influential family. At first, he was most concerned with avoiding any bad publicity. He told a family friend, John Keith, about what happened, and he began searching local hospitals and morgues for Dorothy discreetly. He then hired Pinkerton detectives, who scoured the stage looking for her and traveled as far as Europe, but it wasn't until six weeks later that he finally alerted the police to Dorothy's disappearance. When this also yielded no results, the Arnolds reluctantly went public and offered a reward for information. This produced multiple leads, but none ever panned out. Pretty much every conceivable scenario has been put forth regarding the fate of Dorothy Arnold, including among the loonier ideas that she hit her head, developed amnesia, and started a new life somewhere else. The frontrunner theories were that Dorothy either ran away on her own or she was kidnapped and murdered. She did have a lover that her parents disapproved of, George Griscom Jr., but he joined the search effort for her and eventually moved on and married someone else. The police also looked into a few ransom demands, but they were all dismissed as frauds. Some, like John Keith, believed the young lady committed suicide because publishers rejected her writings. All plausible ideas, but none have ever been proven, and the disappearance of Dorothy Arnold is just as much of a mystery today as it was a hundred years ago. Number 2. The Massacre at Wickenburg On November 5, 1871, eight people, driver included, boarded a stagecoach from Wickenburg in Arizona Territory and headed for San Bernardino, California. Only two of them made it out alive, a man named William Kruger and a woman, Molly Shepard. They claimed that they were attacked by over a a dozen Yavapai warriors who killed the rest and even scalped some of them. However, their story raised a lot of eyebrows. The Wickenburg massacre received a lot of attention because it happened at a time of incredibly tense relations between the government and Native American tribes. Several months prior, 144 Apaches had been murdered in cold blood during the Camp Grant massacre. While Kruger was quick to blame the Avapai, Shepard wasn't as sure, and she mentioned the possibility that they could have been Mexicans in disguise. This alone was enough to raise doubts, but there were a few other curious details. If the attackers were truly Avapai, why would they leave behind valuables such as horses, ammo, and jewelry? More to the point, why would they kill six people and allow two to get away? They were on horses while their victims were on foot. They could have easily caught up with Kruger and Shepard. Inevitably, alternative theories arose. Some were suspicious of the timing. An indigenous tribe happened to commit a heinous atrocity soon after the Camp Grant massacre, which had shifted public sympathy in favor of the Native Americans. They believed that regardless of who did the deed, the goal was to put the blame on the Yavapai. That would also explain why they allowed two witnesses to escape and why Molly Shepard had difficulty identifying her attackers as Native American. Alternatively, some believe that the attack was actually a robbery and that Shepard and Kruger, or at least one of them, was on the inside. Number 1. The Missingest Man in New York On the evening of August 6, 1930, New York Supreme Court Justice Joseph Force Crater met two acquaintances for a dinner at Billy Hass's Chop House in Manhattan. He left them in good spirits, not indicating that anything was wrong, but he was never seen again. His disappearance triggered a massive investigation that became the talk of the whole nation, but all police managed to uncover were the bizarre actions of a man with something to hide and nothing that would indicate what had happened. Happened to him. Days before Crater vanished, he was with his wife Stella at their cabin in Maine. According to her, the judge received a phone call which prompted him to return to New York. When Crater arrived back in the city, he immediately left on a multi day trip to Atlantic City with one of his mistresses. As was later revealed, the judge had a bit of a thing for showgirls. When he returned to New York again, the judge visited his chambers. He destroyed some files and had his secretary send other files to his home. On the day of his disappearance, he withdrew a large sum of money from the bank and bought a ticket to a Broadway show that he didn't attend. Then he went to the aforementioned dinner and vanished off the face of the earth. Consequently, Judge Crater became known as the missingest man in New York and was even eventually declared dead in absentia in 1939. Some believe that he ran away with a mistress, while many others have the feeling that he was the victim of foul play. The story took a twist in 2005 when a woman named Stella Ferrucci Good passed away and left behind a letter claiming that she learned from her husband that a corrupt policeman named Charles Burns and his brother had killed Judge Crater and buried him under the boardwalk at Coney Island. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Also, why not check out another channel I do? It's called Highlight History. I am going to link to that below. And as always, thank you for watching.